welcome you watching Talking Point. Andrew Holland, CEO of Avendis Capital Public Markets. Alternate Strategies joins in to talk to us about his word on the markets. Morning, Andrew. Thanks for joining in. Uh, pleasure to talk to you this Friday morning. First up, the last 12 days, the markets have shown resilience. They've been gradually climbing walls of worries and making new highs. While there may not be too many triggers locally, the big queue that everyone worldwide is watching out for or waiting is the Fed rate cut on the 18th of September. Do you feel like this is going to be one where you, we've bought the news, bought the rumor, and may potentially look to selling the news as soon as it hits the markets? I, I mean, that's what I would usually be thinking, Samina, and good morning and thank you for the opportunity. But, um, you know, it really depends on, on what uh, Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve says. Um, you know, quickly, if it's 25, I think the market's already expecting that, but it's really what the words are about going forward. Because the market's baking in, uh, you know, 100 basis points for the year, um, you know, uh, December, by, by the end of December. So that's a quite a large move from here. So if it does 50, I think the market has further legs to go. If it does 25, then it really depends on the words uh, that, you know, he, he uses to say how quickly he might move for the rest of the year. And I think that would be the key. Uh, so if his remains dovish that, you know, we're on this path downwards in interest rates, I think the market would like that. I think the fear for the market has always been is that, you know, the Federal Reserve did get the kind of uh, uh, the, the move on the upside, uh, you know, delayed. Uh, they thought inflation was transitory. So I think the market's expecting now then to be ahead of the curve. And I think anything that's not seen to be like that uh, would, would cause some more jitters in the markets. But before that, I mean, before the 18th, we have some jobs reports next week, and I think that will give us a, a flavor of uh, how much that uh, rate, increase, uh, rate decrease might be. Is it 25 or 50? Andrew, okay, now let's move focus back to largely what's happening locally uh, as opposed to the global triggers. Uh, one case, of course, is that uh, the possibility of a deep correction may be ruled out at this stage given the amount of consistent domestic inflows. Would you agree with me? Yeah, we've become like a, a low beta market really with all the cash that's sitting in the, well, it's coming into the markets and sitting in the sidelines in some of the mutual funds where I think cash levels are, are reasonably high. So we're all kind of sitting there kind of thinking, you know, valuations are high, we, we need to see a correction. But you're right, I mean, with this, with this weight of money, uh, it's not happening. So unless we have a sustained fall uh, where people feel some pain, um, you know, it's, it's really not going to, you know, kind of stop these flows uh, for the time being. So, but, you know, you're, you're, you're really kind of uh, looking around to find where there's value and it's very difficult to find at the moment. So uh, that's why the market, yes, it's creeping up and it's hitting new highs. Um, but I think, you know, most of the gains for the year, um, and we're looking at, say, 15% earnings growth, and we think markets should you know, rise in line with that. Um, you're already kind of clocked in around 12, um, you know, since April the 1st. So I, I don't think there's that much more to go in the very short term. So I still think the risk is to the downside, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a, a big downside. So if markets globally correct 5%, 10%, uh, we'd probably correct half of that. Mm. Where do you see value among sectors? I do understand the broader market valuation may remain stretched, but where is it that you find value and which are the sectors that cannot be missed in one's portfolio? So it's a, it's a, it's a you know, kind of ongoing uh, kind of uh, uh, equation in terms of finding the, the, the value. I, I'm just not finding it. So I, what I'm doing is continuing to look at, uh, we talked about this before, Sabina, is, is the themes that I think will play out over the longer term where I've have, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to pay higher valuations on, on, on the broad theme. So we talked about these before, but defense spending, renewable uh, spending, um, and, and obviously the themes that I think will play, continue to play will be hospitality. I think people will continue to travel and enjoy experiences. So hotels falls into that. Uh, premiumization in the beverage sector, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages. Um, and you know, the electronic manufacturing sector, which again is a is a is a long runway. We're just at the start of it. So these are the kind of companies and 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 sectors which I think you know are long term themes that are not going to go away from us. Um, but the, the the catalyst I think for the market to move higher, Samita, is is when is the bank sector going to move higher? And I think you know it's been something that we've been talking about. We get excited about. 
um, but uh, it's not it's not really happening. And I think it's, it can only happen once uh, interest rates start to fall in India, and you get those uh, obviously those uh, gains from, from from the bond holdings, which will help the banks, uh, and obviously that would trigger uh, we we hope the the private capex cycle more, and therefore you know lending uh, lending to these corporates. So corporate uh, borrowings and, and lending will start to increase for the banks and get us a, a lot higher ratios going forward. So uh, that's that's where the, the, you know, the problem is, is the banks uh, is not participating really. So maybe with interest rate cuts, that's the catalyst. Hmm. Fair point, you're right. We've all been waiting for the banks trade, the private banks especially, the trade to play out. But, you know, while you indicated that we might see this once rates come off, that is at least, at least six months away. Uh, and that's the regulator has been very clear about, you know, reiterating that time and again that we're still not ready to lower rates even if the Fed does so. In a case such as that, maybe it's... Uh, Maybe now may not be a good time to buy banks. Uh, you know, there would be an opportune moment between now and December to do so. Or would you start lapping up banking stocks uh, now already, if you haven't? Yeah. Um, so if you, if you work on the basis, then, I mean, I take it you're taking that October uh, rate decrease for the RBI is out, so it's going to be more like December. Uh, the banks will have a run into that. Um, so, you know, I think picking them up now, because valuations are quite reasonable compared to other parts of the market, uh, you might just have to hold on a bit longer, uh, take a bit of pain in terms of underperformance. But once that starts, um, you know, there's a lot of underweight uh, foreign investors in the banking sector. Uh, and, I, and I think also, you know, for, for, for local investors, they'd have to kind of start to increase their weightage again towards the private banks in particular. Andrew, are you bullish on the real estate space, which is an important uh, element for domestic capital formation, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's had a great run, and I think we're in that pause phase at the moment. Um, I'm meeting a few companies today, uh, so I'll have a better view on, on where I'm thinking about the real estate market. But it's been, uh, it, it, obviously, we've seen it as, a, as an asset class, people buy more and more. And I think where I'd like to kind of spend more time is looking at affordable housing again, because I still think that that's, you know, if we get that moving, then that pushes up everyone into into the higher uh, levels of, uh, of purchases for, for apartments and, and uh, so forth. So I think affordable housing is where I probably look a little bit harder in terms of finding the right companies, whether it's the financing or it's the it's the building of, of affordable housing. Andrew, how much cash would you recommend an investor to sit on? Would you recommend they sit on some cash, some dry powder? Or do you suggest they be fully invested at this stage? You know, so you know, every time I speak to people, you know, how I, you know, you meet uh, around, and they say, you know, what's your ratio of uh, of debt to equity? And it's it's nearly ninety percent equity, and it's it's hard to say, you know, you should need some money for a rainy day because they're making good money, um, and they've seen, you know, market falls and so forth. But I think, you know, I I I think it depends on your risk appetite. But I I would always have. Um, you know, more than 10% in, I'm not saying cash, but in, in, in some kind of debt instruments for the rainy day uh, in, in case markets fall. And it gives you that opportunity to buy some of the companies at more reasonable prices. Hmm. Well, uh, that's the uh, word coming in on asset allocation. What happens to market cap allocation? You know, from mid last year, we've been harping on about how it's about time that large caps play out. And we saw investors rebalancing their portfolio and moving to the large cap space. Now, most of those large cap mutual funds and stocks have underperformed the broader market names. How do you feel today about what happens between now and maybe the next 6 to 12 months? Do you feel large caps will start rewarding shareholders? Because up until now, that's not happened. If you take the nifty, uh, Samino, and let's just talk about that. I mean, you know, the big weightage there is obviously financials, right, which is uh, 30%. So it goes back to what I was saying, unless financials really start to perform, and we've been, you know, saying it for some time now that we've, you know, we're on the, the verge of it happening. But NIMS remain under pressure. Um, you know, the banking sector in terms of getting deposits remain under pressure. So until something eases in that, um, then uh, you know it's going to be uh, it's going to be hard to kind of say go full uh, full full into the kind of large cap uh, because it's not being supported by the banking sector. Once you feel that that's ready, then that's the time to move. But you know 
if if you look beyond the nifty then you have to go back to the themes that i mentioned um you know to really get to more alpha from, from from just owning the index andrew you know i know you're big on hospitalization but there are so many ancillaries to hospitalization right uh, one of them being aviation it could be travel could be railways how do you feel about that space and i bring up aviation because of the news we heard this morning on spicejet where they've actually uh, going through a little bit of a financial struggle and of course, it was last week where Indigo was struggling with cancellations. Uh, how do you feel about aviation? Is that a place to bet on if India is going to continue to pick up on tourism? I, I think uh, aviation hotels is, is, is the way to play, obviously, the... Uh, the kind of experiences, hospitality uh, sector. Um, you know, I think we're, I, I, I read somewhere, I think we're the third largest kind of uh, travel, you know, in terms of airlines and, and, and in terms of uh, people, passengers in the world now. So that's only going to increase, I mean, because we have a young population and the young population want to, to travel, want to experience something. So, so, you know, it really is at the, you know, the cusp of something changing here where, you know, particularly when you get to over, Two and a half thousand dollars per capita GDP. People will spend more. It goes away from you know your refrigerators, your TVs, and so forth, more towards experiences. So you know we're at the very very start of this. I think there are problems within the airline industry, and I think those will be. Um, you know, I, I don't know what about SpiceJet, but obviously you know any problems there. You know the leaders then, which is kind of probably Air India and Indigo, you know, and Acasa to some extent, are going to be the beneficiaries of that. Um, and, and, you know, they seem to be doing well. Um, so I'm not sure what the problems of SpiceJet are, but I think it doesn't take away from the fact that we all want to travel. Hmm. So I guess that remains still a constructive play. It may just be the survival of the fittest there. Uh, you know, you talked about the young generation, and I guess there are so many themes and so many industries that are catering to just that. Uh, where is your bias, quick commerce or retail players? Uh, because... Uh, at the end of the day, while we all like quick commerce, you still have names like Trent that are trading at record highs with very, very uh, superior valuations. So do we have a bias in that space at all, or you like both quick commerce and maybe traditional retail? I think both are doing ex uh, you know, exceptionally well, right, uh, Samina? I think, um, you know, I, I may be all more old-fashioned, so if I want to go and buy a suit, I'll, I'll go to the shop and buy it. Um, but... Um, you know, I think uh, I think the younger generation are, are more happy, you know, buying on online. Um, but again, I think that experience of of going somewhere, you know, trying things on, I think is 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 not going to go away from us. So I think that will continue. So I think both sides, uh, and as you as you quite rightly mentioned, you know, trends do fantastically well, right? Um, but I think e-commerce is 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 slowly but surely going to eat into that market share. So I think a combination of the two. Uh, is 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 where I'd be at the moment. I, I don't think I'd say it's going to be only e-commerce uh, versus uh, traditional, um, you know, companies like Trend. You know, Andrew and you and me have talked about this extensively as well. Anything PSU was getting lapped up up until a few weeks ago, right? Be it defence, be it shipping, be it banks, be it railways, be it manufacturing infra. I feel like that is getting a little more mature in that sense because you've seen defense PSUs have sold off quite sharply. Uh, I ask you this in the breath that do you feel like oil and gas PSU names may be a good opportunity for investors to make money, not for the next few months, but maybe from a one to two year time horizon? Or those are loss making companies always have been and not too much could be expected from them. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather kind of um, go to themes where I know that there's going to be money spent. So, you know, if I think of uh, railways, um, you know, I can think of, you know, either the, you know, the rail tracks to, to the, the wagons and so forth and so on. So that's where I'd probably put my uh, my bets on those companies um, in, in, in terms of the railways. Uh, in terms of defense and renewables, we know that the country is going to be spending money on this. Everyone in the world is going to be spending more money on defense. So it's the theme that's not going to go away. I think the part of the problem is that when you're forecasting, um, you know, for these defense companies, because, you know, it's obviously shrouded in kind of confidentiality, you don't, there's, there's no visibility on the order book. Um, so when orders come, they come in very bulky um, and that's what pushes the share price. So, 
I think once the ordering starts again, I think you'll see there's a there's a, a fillip to all of these companies, whether it's in you know the, the the defense side or the renewable side. So I'm expecting that to happen from uh, from September onwards. You're going to start seeing a slew of contracts being given by the government um, across these sectors, and and that's the, the next leg of the, of the move up for these companies. It's a quick uh, one, uh, Andrew. In terms of earnings, uh, you know, we our valuation seems so stretched that earnings will have to keep pace, which they haven't. In the first quarter, earnings were largely at best in line. There was no out performance from any sort of vertical in the market. Uh, going ahead, how important is growth going to be to ensure that earnings pick up? Because as, this, as it stands, profit growth hasn't been impressive enough. Uh, do you feel like it's only a matter of maybe a quarter down that uh, the, the growth for the country will, of course, support uh, corporate India or India in growing? So two things there. One is, um, let's talk about the earnings. I mean, it's been you know, quite disappointing, as you said. You know, I've seen more downgrades than I have upgrades um, across, across different sectors. And um, what analysts are doing is, is quietly reducing target prices um, as well, rather than maybe sometimes taking the, 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 the red pen to earnings. Um, but they're expecting probably that earnings will slow. What's going to drive earnings going forward is obviously, you know, the fact that interest rates will fall in India as well as globally uh, going into the back end of the year. And if the CapEx cycle that the government, I just mentioned that the government will kickstart um, in terms of orders, uh, flows through to the private sector, which I believe it will, then that's the extra kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of fill it for the, for, 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 for the market in terms of earnings because, you know, you get a, a lot more kind of, uh, as the money gets spent, you'll get a lot more kind of orders going across different sectors. For example, if you're doing roads, you're going to have more cement and so forth and so on. So that will, I think, be the, the, the earnings driver uh, and the multiplier effects of, of government capex along with private capex in the second half of the year. But it's going to be more, I would say, you know, January to March would probably when you're going to see the earnings start to pick up again, we're more fully into 25, 26. Uh, just a quick uh, few questions now. Uh, Nifty <coughs> higher today or higher in December? Um, I, I, I know we're fortune telling, but yeah. Yeah, I think um, you know maybe two to three percent higher in December. Right, large caps or mid caps? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I would probably uh, I would probably go for mid caps. DIs will drive it or FIs will because we do have the rate cut in September. I think it will be, you know, given our valuations, I think it's going to be more the uh, domestic investors rather than foreign investors. Uh, consumer discretionary, or rather, no, maybe, maybe yeah, premiumization or uh, staples? Premiumization. Right, and also hotels or aviation? Pick one. But, <laughs> I, I, I'd have, um, you know, holdings in both. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can. You you can't just miss out on the airlines and 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 say I you know buy airlines but don't have hotels. Someone's going to stay somewhere. Right. Uh, leisure travel or medical tourism? I'm uh, not so up on medical tourism, so I don't know uh, which of the players for that. Uh, to be honest. Right. And if you just uh, ballpark for me, how much cash should one be sitting on at this stage? It depends on your risk appetite, but anywhere between, I, I would, I would think, um, ten to fifteen percent. Right, Andrew. Always, always good talking to you. You have a good weekend, and we will catch you soon. Thank you for building our perspective and helping our viewers get a better understanding of the markets. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you. Well, one sector that's a buzz with activity today is the sugar space. Sugar stocks uh, are in focus, following a new rule which would allow sugar mills or us uh, use cane juice or syrup for ethanol production let's get in varsha for more perspective on that varsha sugar is in a really sweet space so they've had a good run for the last one month but today of course it's a five to ten percent move on any of the sugar names what's changed what has the union government done and what is the quantifiable impact of this on the sector
Well, thanks, Amina, for that. So, yes, sugar stocks that are buzzing today. So, starting with Dhalmiya Bharat to Hindustan, uh, Hindustan Sugar, Bajaj Hindustan Sugar, then Triveni Engineering, Banari Aman Sugar. All these stocks actually have hit a intraday high of, of more than 10%. Or oh, let's see why this buzz. So, government has put no cap on sugar diversion for ethanol. Earlier, this cap was 24.12 lakh metric ton in uh, ethanol supplier 23-24. Now, this simply means that government has removed move the limit on how much sugar can be used to make ethanol for 24-25 ethanol supplier. Through this, company will be able to generate more revenue and margins because more ethanol now can be produced without any cap. Now, government has a target of taking ethanol blending to 20% in next two years from 13% currently. And government has additionally permitted distilleries to buy up to 2.3 million metric tons of rice from Food Corporation of India exclusively for ethanol production. Now, also to prevent the disruption in domestic sugar availability, the Department of Food and Public Distribution and the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas will work together to monitor and review the diversion of sugar for ethanol uh, production. Now, this all policy change is a part of government's ongoing effort to increase ethanol production and to promote sustainable energy practices. Thank you for that, Varsha. These stocks look good. The industry is going to cheer this move. In fact, like Sakti Sugars indicated to us, it was a bad decision to begin with. So what the government now has done is gone and rolled back on this decision. Our expectation is that there should be no more changes to this policy because that would sentimentally have a bad impact on the sector. For now, that space looking very well placed. And of course, providing some cheer, a Friday cheer to the street. Well, uh, just before we wrap up, not too long ago, private banks were seen as the ideal long-term value creators. But what has changed and has anything changed? We caught up with Nilesha of Kotak Mahindra AMC earlier in years what he had to say about private banks losing steam, but still there if you're looking at long-term wealth creation. As of today, momentum is against private sector banks. One, their limbs are coming down as cost of deposit is going up and they are not able to pass that to the borrowers. Number two, there is a consultation paper on liquidity coverage ratio. If that gets implemented, it is likely to hurt private banks' profitability as they will be putting more money for liquidity coverage. Combination of slowing or reducing NIM along with potential reduction in NIM thanks to allocating more money for liquidity coverage is right now constraining private sector banks' valuation as well as the stock prices. We believe once the liquidity coverage ratio guideline is behind us, its impact factored into the prices, there will be opportunity to add private sector banks and select PSU banks. Whenever you see promoters selling, you need to do your research two times more because he knows infinitely more about his company and valuation than you will know. Now, what we are seeing is that today, yes, undoubtedly some promoters are selling, but many a times they are just setting up their family offices and their money comes back into the same market, albeit in a different, different stocks, different asset classes, purely from a diversification point of view. Second, we are also seeing some promoters who wants to fund their extended families or next generation's business ambitions. They don't want to create cross-holding like it was the trend in the past as it destroys shareholder value. They are selling their stake and putting that capital to use in supporting business ambition of their extended family and next generation. Third, we are also seeing family transition a couple of friends have come together to start a company. Two brothers have come together to start a company, but their kids are not willing to work together. And hence, someone who is classified as a promoter, but who doesn't want to be a promoter is on his way out. We are also seeing some of the foreign companies coming and reducing their stake in India. So each promoter case, one has to look at carefully. If you find a promoter selling because he believes his company is overvalued, then you have to retest your hypothesis, do your due diligence, do your work more, and try to be understanding why promoters are selling. Hmm. 
That was our conversation with Nilesh Shah trying to understand whether one should be concerned that promoters are selling stake uh, in their businesses. And that, of course, has been the recent trend. All the supply that's come in recently, though, has been lapped up by retail investors and institutions locally and globally as well. On that note, we'll wrap up this edition of Talking Point. Thanks for watching. There's a lot more programming on the other side.